Our Inquirer series for newcomers continues today. Inquirers will have their own breakout room to continue learning more about our Unitarian Universalist tradition and this fellowship, and we'll explain more about how to do that after the service is over today. Our social justice plate partner for this month of May is the Women and Children's Alliance. We've been longtime partners with the WCA and we are very grateful for the work that they do supporting women, men, and children towards freedom and responsibility in times of sexual assault and domestic violence. And we know that their work has increased in this time of isolation and quarantine and we're grateful for their presence in our community. Whoever you are and wherever you are on your spiritual journey, you are welcome here. Whoever you love and however you identify, you are welcome here. Whatever faiths you have known, if any, you are welcome here. I invite us all to take a moment to breathe together. To fill our bodies with breath knowing that we breathe with one another, that we breathe with beloved community. Thou art the song of my heart in the morning. Thou art the dawn of truth in my soul. Thou art the dew of the roses adorning. Thou art the woven whole. Thine is the grace to be steadfast in danger. Thine is the peace that none can destroy. Thine is the face of the need-driven stranger. Thine are the wings of joy. Thou art the deep, to the deep in me calling. Thou art a lamp where my feet shall tread. Thy way is steep past the peril of falling. Thou art my daily bread. Thine be the praise of my spirit uplifted. Thou art the sea to each flowing stream. Thine be the days that are gathered and sifted. Thou art the deathless dream. Each week, we light our flaming chalice, a symbol of our free faith, a beacon of hope, love, and justice. We join in this lighting in solidarity and community with hundreds of other Unitarian Universalists lighting chalices today in homes and in virtual worship services, reminding us that we are connected to one another and to a larger community of faith and love. If you have a chalice nearby, we invite you to light it with us. And if you are able, hold it up to your camera and switch to gallery view 
to see all of the chalices being lit today. Then you're invited to share in the chat. The chalice is lit on Balsam Street, for example, or Marshall or wherever your street is. As our chalices are lit, we offer you this call to worship on the streets of nature from Ayla Astor. On the street of nature, the flowers all bloom and make the world alive. On the street of nature, the stream sings its song and bubbles the world around. On the street of nature, the trees all sway and dance along with the wind. On the street of nature, the animals jump and play all around the world. On the street of nature, the sky is blue and white swirls around with it. On the streets of nature, come, let us worship together. I want to invite our children to come a little closer to your screen for our time for all ages this morning. We are beginning our story with a pair of ants. Oh my gosh. There we go. There are a lot of things about ants that are pretty special. They have a really interesting way of working together and of communicating without verbal speech and from across really great distances. I wonder what these ants have to show us today. This is the alphabet tree, said the ant. Why is it called the alphabet tree, said his friend. Because not so long ago, this tree was full of letters. They lived a happy life, hopping from leaf to leaf. On the highest branches of this tree. Each letter had its favorite leaf, where it would sit in the sun and rock in the gentle breeze of spring. One day, a breeze became a strong gust. And the gust became a gale. The letters clung to the leaves with all of their might, but some were blown away. And the others were very frightened. When the storm passed, they huddled together in fear, deep in the foliage of the lower branches. A funny bug that was red and black with bright yellow wings saw them hiding in the shade and asked them what they were doing there. We are hiding from the wind, explained the letters, but who are you? I am the word bug, the bug answered. I can teach you how to make words. If you get together in the trees, in threes and fours, and even more, no wind will be strong enough to blow you away. Patiently, he taught the bugs how to form letters, form their letters into words. Words like up and me. And while they were still learning and they were having a hard time arranging themselves, they had a really fun time and formed ha laughing as they went.
but the bug wanted them to form bigger words. Words like bug and care and earth. Happily, they climbed onto the highest branches of the alphabet tree, and when the wind came, they held on without fear. The word bug had been right. Then one summer, early in the morning, a strange caterpillar appeared. He was woolly and purple and very large. And he saw the words scattered around the trees and the leaves. And he didn't like it. Why don't you get together and make sentences and mean something? The letters had never thought of this. Now they could write and say things. They thought about the wind, the leaves, and the bug. So they formed sentences about what they saw. Leaves are green, they said. Uh, they listed their favorite thing to do. We sing. And what they thought about the wind. Wind is bad. The caterpillar liked their progress. They were doing well. He looked at them and said, that's good, but not good enough. Why, said the letters, surprised. Because you must say something important, something with meaning. So the letters thought as hard as they could. Something important, really important. Finally, they knew what they had to say and they excitedly began to spell their sentence, to make their meaningful sentence, thinking about everything they had learned together. The sentence began, this is my home. And the caterpillar invited them to climb onto his back. One by one, the letters began to do so, climbing onto the caterpillar's back. And he turned and he started taking them away. And they said, where are we going? As they climbed onto his back, finishing the sentence, this is my home, but not just my own. And the caterpillar said, we are going to take this important sentence to the people I wonder, how do we work to listen to what nature has to say? What are ways we can live in more harmony with the earth? What messages, what message is most important for you to share? And who can help you discover and share this important message? I want to invite our children to join me in our children's chapel with the Zoom room appearing on your screen in a moment. Um, we are going to do an activity for the story we've just heard. Adults, please join in in singing the children to their religious exploration space. The words will also appear on your screen.
Thank you, Jim, for that fantastic wonder board story. I don't know about all of you, but I am really enjoying these stories on Zoom. I find myself leaning into the camera to try to get as close as I can to the creatures in the story as it appears on the board. It's been such a gift to have stories every Sunday. Thank you for that. One of the ways that we practice doing the work of justice as a people is with a spiritual practice of generosity. When we take up an offering each week to support the ministry of this fellowship and the ministry of our monthly plate partner. And I know that we're missing those physical baskets and the passing of the offering basket and the way that that practice feels in our space together, giving us that time to reflect. But you can still do that practice online. You can go right now to our website at boiseuu.org and click on Give in the top right corner of your screen. You can see a sample of what you'll see there when you go onto the website and fill out the donor form and give your offering right now, making this online practice as spiritual a practice of generosity as possible. If you want to participate in the offering as usual with 25% of that offering going to our plate partner at the end of the month, just fill out the special, the Sunday offering box. If you would like your gift to be directed otherwise, please use the special contribution box and make notes for us in the comments. Our plate partner this month, of course, as we mentioned, is the Women and Children's Alliance. And to honor the vital work of their ministry, our own Dina Duke is here to share a poem from her new book, a collection of poetry, a beautiful new book called In Your Bones. Thanks, Dina. Hi, everybody. Hello. I asked Reverend Sarah if I could speak about the Women and Children's Alliance today, because they are an organization whose mission is not just to provide safety, but also healing and freedom from domestic abuse of all kinds. This is a difficult mission even in the best of times, and now victims may well find themselves sheltering in place with their abusers. So it's harder than ever to identify who needs help and get them to a safe place and then provide them with and their children with everything else they need, including the healing that is so essential. But what does the face of domestic violence look like? Nobody wants it to look like their face. But the truth is that it looks like mine. It might look like yours. It can look like your neighbors, your daughters, your friends. I wanna share a poem with you that I wrote based on a situation I found myself in almost 50 years ago now. And I've often wondered how my life and my mother's life would have been different if there had been an organization like the WCA in my hometown. This poem is entitled, Why? You stood behind platters of puffed eggs and sizzled sausages while we looked for signs. Your hand slid down the baby blue checked apron as your eyes sunk to the floor like rocks. Your back bathed in sunlight over the sink, bent to lay sunflower dishes down without a sound. Your eyes stayed stuck to the linoleum when a sign was what we needed. Then it was just us with me begging you to go. And we packed the faded yellow Nova full of empty clothes and our jumpy hearts. But we didn't know where to go. 
and ended up at the parsonage where the pastor insisted. And you turned the car right around and found the apron, the lipstick, the pans, the placemats, the floor, right as you left them. I understood the bitterness of the pill you swallowed that day, but I never looked for your eyes again. Thank you to the WCA for being a place where people can find safety and healing and freedom. Thank you. Thank you, Dina, for your beautiful, raw and powerful words. Our offering will now be received. <clears throat> Driving through Arizona And I've seldom been thinner With that chip on my shoulder This past year I got so much older Looking back over my life, spent the most of it tongue tied. I wish I had more time listening to you speak your mind. Cause I'm thinking about you every day on my mind, a typical way. Are you realizing? Think about you every day on my mind, a typical way. All you way life goes. Drinking coffee black as iron. Man, I couldn't get much higher. Without falling out of my chair I've been numb for so many years I'm thinking about you every day On my mind, a typical way Of you way life force I'm thinking about you every day On my mind, a typical way Of you way life force So easy to be blinded by the light, to feel lonely in the night. It's blowing in the breeze, babe. I got dust in my eye, rust in my mind. I'll come home by next spring. Won't you say you love me later by and by? Looking back over my life, oh, spent the most of it tongue tied. Oh, Pulling my belt tight. It's just me and the stars tonight. The two fingers and the tight line to keep my head above the alpine. I spend more time listening to you speak your mind. Cause I'm thinking about you every day on my mind, a typical way. Are you a life force? I'm thinking about you every day on my mind, a typical way.
Thank you. Thank you, Maya and Michael. That was beautiful. We're so blessed to have so many talented musicians who have so graciously and willingly shared their music with us, particularly on Zoom in these past weeks. And we look forward to seeing more and more of them as the weeks go on. Our earth has been at the threshold for a while now. And we've called this threshold by a lot of different names over the years. The hole in the ozone layer, global warming, we've talked of saving the planet and environmental activism, climate change. And it's only been in the last year or so that we've really begun to refer to this threshold as a crisis, a climate crisis. Because I think we're coming to terms with the fact that there is no better word. A crisis does not mean all hope is lost. Crisis doesn't mean we should let despair take over and lie down and give up. We've all been through crises before of varying kinds, perhaps none quite like the one we find ourselves in now. A central core of my own theology is that we live with an abundance of possibility and creativity in our world. We live with a capacity to affect great change. And we see it, it exists in our own lives in this community. It allows us to get through the seemingly insurmountable challenges. I mean, we're doing it right now. I remember many years ago, right at the beginning of my early formation in ministry, I got into an argument with a senior colleague. He worked at the time for the UU Ministry of the Earth and he was making the circuit preaching to congregations about climate change and environmental activism. And he was talking to UUs about the role that we should play in change making and advocating for our planet and our interdependent web. As I listened to him talk in this gathering of colleagues, really he was venting, lamenting about the fact that he couldn't seem to get people fired up to understand the dire nature of the crisis, that our planet was dying, that our world would have no future for our children if we didn't act, that life as we know it would cease to exist and it would all be our fault. I accused him of peddling in despair. While we may all agree with some of that sentiment now, as hard as it is to hear, that wasn't quite, we weren't quite there at that time with that level of threat was just emerging. And I chastised him for his extreme language. I kind of let him have it for whipping up such intense fatalism and despair. It was just too much. At the time, my youngest was just a baby. And I told him that as a mother, despair was not motivating. It felt shaming. It didn't give me anything to work toward. It made me want to shut out the world and ignore everything. And I could not welcome or wrap my mind around a vision of the world that felt so bleak and lifeless. This was not the world to which I wanted to bring my children. And I suggested that he figure out how to find a balance in his rhetoric, an angle that allowed for hope. Because without hope, without possibility, why bother? But now the older I get and the older my children get, the more stark the reality of this crisis is and it seeps into my bones and I feel sometimes that cloud of anxiety and despair over this climate crisis hovering closer. I sense myself truly teetering on that thin edge between despair and hope. 
And then we are hit with this pandemic. And I would be lying if I said that I didn't experience moments of utter hopelessness about the state of our world and the deep, terrifying whisper of why bother. But we've all seen it. And I've been preaching about it most weeks that this pandemic amidst the grief and the sadness and the tragedy has also shown us incredible moments of human endurance of joy, of thriving, including the thriving of our planet. I mean, just a few weeks into the shutdown, and it felt to me like the sky was bluer and there were more stars out at night. We've seen unprecedented drops in air pollution all over the world, including right here in Boise. We've heard reports, or maybe we've seen the videos of wild animals reclaiming the streets and parks, of songbirds singing louder, more of them more prevalent. We're seeing evidence of our collective behavior having a major positive impact on our planet. And to actually experience it is rather stunning. We're learning, we're witnessing that we can change our habits, that we can pivot quickly, and we can see the beauty that comes from that. Our rapid and effective response to COVID-19 offers us a roadmap to shifting into this emergency mode, a mode we could imagine as a possible response to our climate crisis. It shows that we can take radical action to protect people. If people and politicians and government and systems and corporations truly want to. And yes, this is a beauty and a hope born out of pain and economic hardship. And we know that things are likely to go right back to normal once global restrictions are fully lifted. But we also know that we can rebuild a better world in the aftermath of this pandemic. We know that individual choices and behavior aren't enough to make lasting change, that we need to impact change in large corporate and political systems and agriculture and manufacturing and energy. But this moment sparks the hope and possibility that will keep us moving forward. This moment challenges us to see the collective impact of the kind of world community spoken of in our sixth principle, where humanity comes together for the sake of all of us, where we make great change without having to know the exact outcome. Thank you to our Climate Action Team for all of the opportunities you gave us this month to engage, to educate, to act. Our Earth Month 2020 allowed us to dive deep into so many different facets of this crisis and how we can stay with it and push for change. Because unlike some thresholds, this one will require us to leap, to push to drag others across, to face the unknown, and to be willing to change a lot. But we know we can do it. Our Climate Action Team's programs this month shared some of the most influential shifts that we can make from reducing and even trying to eliminate our use of plastics, reducing our food waste, planting a garden, eating a more plant-based diet. And although we recognize that these individual choices may not be quite enough to, stip, to tip the scales, when we choose to make these shifts in our own lives, it reinforces our commitment to staying focused on creating a shift in our wider world, in our wider circles, in our wider systems. It becomes a kind of spiritual practice that fuels our collective action. What struck me 
most during this Earth Month 2020 and the programming that was shared was how beautifully it all lifted up the intersectional nature of this crisis. Exploring the ways in which the climate crisis disproportionately and negatively impacts indigenous people, communities of color, and those living in poverty. And how they share deep concerns about how to affect change in their own communities. And that listening to them, listening to these communities and to their collective wisdom for how we might move forward will be critical to our lasting success. I found it fascinating to learn that the t in the top 10 solutions to the climate crisis, it includes the education of girls and family planning. The social justice issues that we hold dear as Unitarian Universalists are all connected to one another. And each will benefit from the attention and advocacy and all the justice work that we do together, even in the justice work that we're doing now from our homes, from our computers. Regardless of our politics, we know that all people want a thriving environment. So many of us have felt this renewed sense of sacredness and blessing from our earth as the result of this pandemic. This forced slowing down of life allowed many of us to get outside more often, to enjoy nature in full bloom. Certainly for me, I found that the intensity and sadness of this moment also activated more gratitude for the beauty of the earth and all that it offers. I breathe more deeply. I walk outside almost every day and I allow myself to wander. While I was taking video for the prayer that I will share with you in a moment, wandering through the beautiful grounds right here on the church property and the sacred spaces of our campus, filming it all on my iPhone, I found myself laughing with utter delight at my little adventure and at the sheer beauty and wonder that surrounded me. I felt so deeply grateful to be able to walk among the trees, to experience the beauty and love right in our own backyard. Those are the moments when I feel most at peace, most connected to the source of life and to my faith. It will take all of us to insist there is a climate emergency and that much change is needed from all of us as individuals, businesses, and political leaders alike. The climate crisis is not a call for our doom. It is a call for us to demonstrate our fearlessness, our commitment to hope, to possibility, to humanity, and to all that sustains us. It's a call for us to demonstrate our unwillingness to give up but to keep pushing, keep learning, keep advocating, and keep celebrating as we cross this next threshold together with a vision that Earth Month can last forever. May it be so. I invite you to join me in the spirit of prayer with this prayer for our Earth. Spirit of life and love, holy mystery. The threshold of our earth calls to us, singing a song of hope, a song of peace, a song for our collective future, for all beings, for life itself. 
O oh Earth, our mother, father, protector, and sustainer, turn our despair into delight, our delight into determination, to find a path through the chaos, through the fear, through the darkness, that we might move toward possibility, toward creativity, to do all we can to save you, to save us from ourselves. O oh Earth, O oh teacher who has cleared the way that all life might thrive, may we find comfort in your beauty. May we breathe in your nourishment, welcome your strength and fortitude, knowing our lives depend on yours. May we feel our own rootedness, seeking the quiet stillness to hear the wisdom of our ancestors. May we feel and be sustained by your embrace and listen to the whispers of life calling to life. We have a long way to go yet, more thresholds to cross, more uncertainty to bear. May we keep on moving forward, knowing the path in front of us will lead to great change. May we stay open and willing, knowing that we bring the commitment of this community with us, filled with the gratitude for all that is our life and all that we can be together. In the spirit of all that is holy, we pray. Amen. One of the ways we stay connected to one another is by sharing the joys and sorrows of our community and holding one another in the spirit of love and care, even as we are isolated, even as we're apart. We have several joys and sorrows to share with you this morning. I'll begin with our joys. A joy from Sherry Tish, all the way from Spokane, who is so grateful for Zoom and so grateful to be able to remain connected to this community, even at a distance, as she moved to Spokane shortly before the shutdown and is loving being able to see old friends. Claudia and Larry Fernsworth shared the joy that their daughter and son-in-law are debt-free after a rough patch and working very hard to maintain their status. Congratulations, that's a tough road. Kat Reese shares that her son Gowan will be graduating this spring. Congratulations, Gowan. And the school is allowing seniors to walk at the Ford Center at the end of June. We're so proud of that accomplishment. And also in these times of isolation, the sorrows are surfacing, and our community shares many sorrows this month and these past weeks. Michael Howard shares that his father's dementia and physical health is deteriorating, and he had to hospitalize his dad recently. 
and he asks for thoughts and prayers as they navigate this next space of time together. We share the sorrow of Eileen Gettings and her family at the death of her mother. For Jeanette Young and her fiance, Wendell Martin, Wendell's mother also died recently and the loss of their best friend. And Sandy Cruz, who shares two losses in her family, the death of a cousin and the death of an aunt to COVID. Harriet Shackley, we hold her and the family in our hearts at the news of her own brother's death to COVID. And the challenges that all of our families face in these deaths to hold their grief far away from one another. And we hold Mary Stell in our hearts who recently was diagnosed with breast cancer whose recent surgery went very well and is so grateful for the love and care of this community. These are many sorrows and we hold them with tenderness and with love, sharing our sorrow across the distance with all those who are hurting. Know that we are with you. Know that you are loved. Know that we hold you in our thoughts and in our prayers. As we hold these joys and sorrows, I invite you to place your hand over your heart as we listen to this rendition of Spirit of Life from our very own choir recorded in a church in Transylvania. It begins with the Hungarian and moves into the English. And as we allow the music to wash over us, offering us a healing balm, you are invited to add any additional joys and sorrows into the chat box.
In his 1967 book, The Medium is the Massage, Canadian philosopher Marshall McLuhan writes, ours is a brand new world of all at onceness. Time has ceased, space has vanished. We now live in a global village, a simultaneous happening. McLuhan, was addressing how communication technology, the media, was changing the way people thought, learned, and believed. Since he first penned that phrase, our global village, our world, has seemed to shrink even more, thanks to the internet, social media, faster and cheaper ways of video communication, etc. And there is nothing like a pandemic to transform the human world in a few short months. The COVID-19 phenomenon brings a startling new appreciation of McLuhan's words. Ours is a brand new world of all at onceness. Time has ceased, space has vanished. We now live in a global village, a simultaneous happening. The popular trope is, we are all in this together. It's true. No one can deny that the novel coronavirus has had a profound impact on the world. Loved ones, friends, and acquaintances are directly impacted. Work, pleasure, and free time have shifted. And yet, are we really all in this together? Is the white collar employee work from, working from home with a company issued laptop really sharing the same experience as a healthcare worker who cares for the medically vulnerable, or for that matter, the medically vulnerable person who is being cared for? In 1993, when our congregation and the congregation of the Uni Unitarian Church of Mayskew formed a pact of kinship we could never have imagined how our world would look a short 27 years later. The physical distance between our towns is over 5,700 miles, 9,200 kilometers. In 1993, we still communicated via letter and the rare expensive telephone call and every communication required someone to translate between English and Hungarian. We began to have email communication in the late 1990s, and over the years, more and more people have been able to travel. These visits have been extraordinary experiences for the people who have been able to make the journey. We felt as if we were all in this together, but were we? Only a, few lucky, uh, only a lucky few have been able to see, taste, touch, and savor physically being with our siblings of faith. Even with pictures, videos, sermons, and music, there is no real way to share the experiences, no real way to truly equally communicate. The partner church teams of both congregations have struggled with how to bring true parity to our relationship. Our Boof team took one small step to that end in March by changing our name from the Partner Church Committee to Boise Mesco Partnership Ministry. And now this pandemic, coupled with the amazing capabilities of technology, make it possible for many more in both congregations to potentially reach out to each other in a new, more egalitarian way. In-person gatherings and travel will most likely be canceled or severely restricted for the next many months, if not years. And many members of both congregations do not have the means to travel. How do we nurture relationships across distances and divides? 
In honor of the 27th anniversary of our partnership this week, the partnership ministry of both congregations launched a new joint Facebook group called Kishid Little Bridge and subtitled Miske Boise Fan Club. The purpose of the group is to provide a virtual forum where members and friends of both congregations can deepen our connections. Little Bridge, known as Kishid in Hungarian, on the grounds of the Boise UU Fellowship, is the inspiration for the name of the group. It is a symbol of the connection between our two congregations. Many members of both congregations have already become members of the group, and I ask if you have accepted the invitation to join, please invite other members and friends of our congregation if you're friends with them on Facebook. Our plan is to provide occasional updates to the group in both English and Hungarian. But if you enter a message in English, I believe it will be translated to Hungarian for the Hungarian speaking Facebook participants. And when a congregant from Mesku posts in Hungarian, it will be translated into English if you select the translation, translate button. The translations aren't the best, but it's a start. For those of you who live or have lived with a spouse or partner, you have probably had an experience where you said something that made perfect sense to you, but your loved one didn't seem to understand what you were talking about. Now imagine that you are writing this perfectly understandable thing in a different language than the folks who will be reading your message. So please join in this new communication adventure where connections can be made and relationships heightened across geography and culture. Ours is a brand new world of all at onceness. Time has ceased, space has vanished. We now live in a global village, a simultaneous happening. Thank you, Gwen, for your words of wisdom and care and support for our partnership. It, it has been a great joy to experience the unfolding and the continued growth of this partnership ministry since I have become the minister of this congregation. And I'm so very grateful for the extended collegial connection and congregational connection across an ocean. Part of the beauty of being in partnership with other Unitarian churches, even across the globe, is knowing that we are not alone. Knowing that we struggle together toward our highest ideals. That we struggle together to understand how to help our planet, how to help each other, and how to serve humanity. We take comfort in the common bond that unites us even as we navigate differences of language, of culture, of theology. And we ground ourselves in the words of this beautiful Hungarian blessing, Hazi Aldash, heeding its call of the faith, peace, love, and blessing fueled by our partnership. Whole heat otzeretet, where there is faith, there is love. Hoseretet otbeke, where there is love, there is peace. Holbeke od aldash, where there is peace, there is blessing. Holaldash od ishten, where there is blessing, there is God. Hol ishten od sugshek ninshen, where there is God, there, there is no need. Normally on this day, we would travel out to our bridge to the beautiful sacred space that represents the beautiful wooden architectural carvings found in Transylvania. And we all have a toast of palinka together. But we have something even better than that today because we are joined live by Reverend Balint all the way from Mesca to offer his blessing and the blessing of the people of Mesca for our partnership ministry. Thank you, Reverend Sarah. Good morning, everybody, again. 
even if I am far away from you in body, I am with you in spirit. I am happy to learn how well you are getting along. It is good to hear that your faith is so strong. These are not my words. These are from the New Testament. And these were the words I was using today in my sermon in Mesco. Over the world where the pandemic reached and churches were closed, church officials worried that people get too much used to distancing, non-presence, and will no longer be as eager as before to be present in person in the religious communities. They might be right, as this is true with the partner church movement. Those partnerships thrive that had the occasion of frequent personal encounters. You know this. As I told you today, we had our first Sunday worship service in Minsk in the open air, in person, after two months. 10% of the congregation showed up, but it was raining, it was windy, and it was very cold. And I think it is a very good beginning. Maybe in normal times, only half of this would have shown up in normal circumstances if, if I would have advertised um, an open space worship service in such a rainy day. But these are crazy times and extreme times. This year, our plans to meet with some of you from Boise here in Mesco in person were swept by the pandemic. But today, we can be with each other. And I'm thinking that maybe in normal times, nobody would have considered this possibility to have this virtual coming together. I'm grateful for this opportunity. One gate is closed, the other opens. We have turned 27 years old in our partnership. In several Eastern and Central European countries, the age limit until people who study in educational institutions can use for free or at a discount price the public transportation system is 26. When they turn 27, they are no more allowed to do that. I assume governments calculated by this age, everybody should be up alive and should be able to pay for the expenses from their own resources. Here we are, we have left behind 26 and we turned 27 in our common journey. And supposedly we should be able to stand on our own foot and participate in this journey at our own costs. But in fact, we have always been present in this journey using our own resources. And what were and are the resources? I think that one is the commitment for the partnership, a mutual attraction and interest, spiritual interest for each other. And of course, our core values that we share in spite of all the differences that we have. 27 years is a long time. During this time, a child grows up. Maybe even a grandchild is born. 27 years is a long time in a relationship as well. But by this time, one can surely tell if it is worth investing in this or not. And I'm confident that the answer is yes in our case. Thank you all who feel the same. Thank you all who cherish this friendship. Thank you all fellow travelers from Boise. It is it was and it is, and hopefully it will be a great journey. In the hope for better times, and in the hope of numerous personal encounters, I'm sending the blessings of my community from Mesko, Ishtar Arion. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Balint. And we share in those blessings and send our blessings through you back to the people of Mesca, Ishten Nadia, to all of you. We love you and we're grateful 
for this partnership ministry together. Thanks for being with us today. Speaking of taking a deep breath, like Reverend Sarah talked about in her reflection, um, I, probably like a lot of you, needed one. So last weekend, I went out to Leslie Gulch, which you see a picture of right there um, out in the Oahis. If you haven't visited, definitely do that. Um, trying to get away, trying to clear my head. And it dawned on me that Reverend Sarah had asked Alvarado and I to play at this service on, opening sp on open spaces, and we had no songs about open spaces. So um, I started writing lyrics just leaning on one of the rocks in Leslie Gulch and um, picturing a desert homesteader fighting against nature in all of its forms. Um, so this is a new song for you. <laughs>
Thank you, Wyatt. I feel especially grateful knowing that you wrote that with this service in mind and with all of us in mind. It feels like our song. I invite you to put your hands over your heart for our closing blessing. I want to thank all of the participants who joined us this morning, Gwen, Roby, Dina, Wyatt, and Michael. Thank you, Rachel Strong, who provides all of our technical support, and thank all of you from Zooming in from home. It's a real gift to have this time to share the wonder of this community, of our sacred spaces, of all that we have with one another. Love lives here. In the trees, in the dirt, in the sky, in our community, in our partnership, faith lives here, in our hope for a brighter future, for all we know is possible, in our willingness to be changed. Make no mistake, what we do here matters. Go in peace, and stay tuned for our Breakout Rooms and Inquirers series. Go knowing you are loved. I could just listen to that all day, all of the beautiful music from all of our musicians. We're going to thank you so much for it. We're going to head into our breakout rooms for our coffee hour together. Uh, these breakout rooms get configured automatically. So for those who 